A lot of people are unhappy with their financial situation, but they're not sure what they can do about it. My guest this week knows how you can create your own luck with money. Grant Spatier went from completely broke to financially independent in five years. He'll share with us how he was able to get a raise, start a business, and achieve financial freedom. Welcome to the Maple Money Show, the podcast that helps Canadians improve their personal finances to create lasting financial freedom. Today's show is brought to you by our sponsors at Borowell. I personally love their mission to help Canadians make great decisions about credit. They've taken a product that used to be $23 a month and made it absolutely free. If you haven't already, head over to maplemoney.com slash borowell to get your free credit score, free credit report, and continual monitoring. That's maplemoney.com slash B-O-R-R-O-W-E-L-L. Let's chat with Grant. Hi, Grant. Welcome to the Maple Money Show. Hey, glad to be on. Uh, so I wanted to have you on. Um, often I don't get into people's personal stories as much. We just try to tackle something. But but your story is really interesting. And I, I know there'll be a lot that uh, of, of actionable advice within that anyway. So so let's kind of go right back to the, the beginning with you. Um, I, I know uh, in, in college is, is kind of when you were sort of kind of hitting a, a financial rock bottom. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, so I studied philosophy in college and, um, you know, liberal arts degree, went to a good school, uh, towards the end of college, just had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to be a writer, you know, just like a lot of people, um, didn't have really a career track. Uh, I ended up taking a job, a company came and recruited on my campus, uh, and I took a job, you know, they put like $40,000 in front of me, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And I took the job, and it actually I had to go, it was a two-hour uh, commute each morning and each evening into the Chicago suburbs, and it was absolutely terrible, and I was like, oh my gosh, is this what real life is like. I remember calling my dad and he said, you know, welcome to the real world. And um, it was absolutely terrible. And the next three years I bounced around four different jobs until I ended up getting laid off. Uh, I was working with a newspaper and then found myself living back home at my parents at the age of 24. And this is in August 2010. And they basically said, hey, you can crash here three months, but we're not going to give you a dime. And I, you know, it's just like, oh man, this, you know, it's like, what a way to put the pressure on. And yeah. my, some of my friends were doing pretty well. And so that, that's really the start of my financial journey was when I found myself literally sleeping in the same bed that I slept in as a seven year old, uh, being like, gosh, man, I, I went to school. I worked so hard and here I am just back up, you know, back where I started. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of a, a thing that people always like to say about millennials. They, they all live with their parents, but, but obviously you didn't want to stay there. <laughs> you wanted to, right, to, right. to come back. So, so what was the, uh, other than your parents telling you you had three months, what, what sort of made you decide that you have to change something? Yeah. So there were a few things. So I was spending a lot of time with my parents and I'd come down, you know, we'd have dinner every night uh, together, just like when I was a kid and they'd be like, you know, how, how's it, how's it applying to jobs? And I actually had applied to over 200 jobs oh, wow. you know, over the previous four months and I hadn't gotten a single email or call back. So I was really dejected. And, you know, I started getting that look from my parents. It's just like, you know, what are you doing? You know, there's kind of some shame. Uh, there. And, you know, it felt really crappy because my parents, you know, given me a lot of opportunities and, um, you know, I'm an only child and I, I, I didn't not only like the feeling of not having any money, I didn't like the feeling of disappointing them and being stuck there. And I felt pretty helpless, man. Um, and I started looking at my parents too. And I remember going to, you know, there was like a summer party and I talked to some of their friends. And one of the things that really clicked to me is, you know, all these people were in their mid fifties and all they were talking about was retirement. You know, that they were just like, Oh, you know, I'm five years away and here's what I want to do. That's literally all they talked about. And I started looking at my parents and just how hard and how long them and their friends, you know, had worked and how this was some sort of insane, you know, goal that they were, they were working to some future, you know, that they, that they, they envisioned for themselves. And I was like, you know what? Um, 
could there be a different way? I didn't want to go back to a cubicle job. You know, I was looking like, gosh, 40 years to retire. This sounds terrible. And I was like, you know what? I got nothing to lose. Uh, I'm going to try to learn everything that I can about money. And that was the, the moment uh, shortly thereafter in August 2010, I read Your Money or Your Life, which is my favorite book of all time, hands down. Just the simple idea that whenever you're working, you're trading your life energy for money just like really blew my mind. I was just like, yeah. yes. Uh, and so I was like, I'm going to try to make as much money as possible, but I didn't really have any skills that <laughs> would make me <laughs> any money. So then I was like, okay, I need some skill. And a couple of days later I was doing a search on my phone uh, and I saw a Google mobile ad and I was like, well, what's this? Um, and I researched Google mobile ads and figured out that you could make between 10 and 20% of media spend running the ads and then you could actually learn how to do it for free. And so Google had at the time Google AdWords University and you know they still have some form of it today but you could go through and get certified by Google for free. Fast forward 60 days later and I had a $50,000 job at a digital marketing agency running Google AdWords campaigns even though I had no experience but the demand was high. I had the certification and I walked in. I was so pumped. Uh, it was the first digital marketing job I applied to, uh, and I was so excited. I went in, and the woman later told me, she's like, you're just so passionate about this that we could not hire you. So that's really where my, where my life started. And so for the next five years, I was either working uh, to make money or side hustling to make money or reading about making money. Uh, and to be honest, it was pretty much all I did for, uh, for that period. And it took me uh, five years, three months, and six days to go from completely broke to financially independent. And so that happened in, uh, in 2015. Yeah, that, that, that's been a great story. Um, one thing I want to go back to there was uh, d during this time at your job, I, I know you had uh, sort of a, a, a line that I've read somewhere about uh, hacking your job to get a raise. Can, can you go into that a bit? Oh, man. Oh, this is like one of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, one of the things, oh, gosh, there's so many things I could talk about here. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think a lot of people undervalue their time. Um, you know, they, they think, oh, my employer is only going to pay me so much, or they just read the same generic article on how to get a raise. But, you know, there's an entire science around this. Um, you know, I talk about in my book, the difference between real and perceived value. And one of the things that's really important to understand, and, you know, I've managed you know, a number of employees in my life. I've owned my own companies. And one of the things that you have to learn is it doesn't matter how much time you spend at your desk. It doesn't matter how busy you are, how many meetings you have. All that matters is what your boss thinks about you. And maybe they care that you're early uh, and that's unfortunate, but a vast majority of, of, of the time, your boss just wants, wants to look good to their boss or your boss wants to make more money. And so really getting to know the person and trying to know the person and understand what motivates them is the key to making more money, not being busier or doing a ton of things. And so getting to know that person and then as long as you make them look good, uh, you know, you're much more likely to get a raise. One of the things I recommend that's really simple is a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, I did so much work and they didn't give me a bonus or didn't give me a raise. You know, you're getting paid to do a job. And so, you know, you're getting a salary to do your job, maybe you have a minimum bonus, but you get rewarded when you go above and beyond or when you add some extra level of value. But the problem is your boss is probably too busy to notice what you're doing. Uh, things move fast. And a lot of people, they get to the end of the year and they're like, you know, I worked hard and I want to raise. One of the things I recommend is create just a simple Excel spreadsheet or Google sheet and track every single thing you do the entire year that goes above and beyond your job description. And one of the things, if you do this over multiple years, you can actually even start to quantify it. So, hey, I answered, you know, 25 uh, you know, percent more calls this year, or I responded to X, Y, and Z. And so what you can do is then at the end of the year, revisit that file when you're going in to get your bonus and look for those things that had the biggest impact and say, hey, you know, I've been tracking what I've been doing above and beyond. You know, a lot of it comes down in the pitch too. Uh, one of the things a lot of people, a lot of my old employees, they just come in and just be like, I deserve a $10,000 raise. And it's like, you know, okay, tell me why. 
Um, and oftentimes, you know, they don't really have a good story. They're like, I've been working hard or, um, you know, this is what my market value is. But if you can craft that story and ultimately craft that story in a way that does a few things. Number one, it reinforces that you want to stay with the company. So come in and say, hey, you know, I've learned so much this past year. I love working here. You know, I really want, you know, I really want my future to be here, you know, you know, pad it up a little bit and then go into the more quantifiable aspects like, you know, I, I really want to stay here and, you know, here, here are 10 things that I've done that went above and beyond and it's contributed to the business in this way. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, if you can actually present those in a way that your boss, you know, maybe they're in charge of your unit, they can then take them and package them for their boss. It's going <laughs> to give you a much higher chance at actually getting a raise. Um, you know, this is career management is a science. It's not a lot of people. It just blows my mind. It's just like most a lot of people don't even they spend more time planning their vacation than they do with their money. They spend even less time actually trying to manage their career, something that can just have a massive impact on how much money uh, they're going to make for the rest of their life. So don't just read like two articles on it, you know, study it and become an expert in it like anything else, because it's going to have a really, really incredible ROI. Yeah, I had I had a similar result. Um, uh, just just going on the the websites that sort of list average salaries and stuff. I, I had a good feeling that I was being underpaid, but that's not the that's not the reason I asked for the raise. I didn't go in and say you're not paying me enough. Um, I, right. I, I did very similar like what you said, where where I'm showing it's like, well, these are the things I did, and this is how much money it's saving. If uh, uh, I think one thing was um, I created a report that now. Uh, 600 different stores didn't have to <laughs> send in right. their own reports. And it's like the amount of hours that saves, I, I pointed all that out. And uh, yeah, I think it was about a $10,000 raise. And at the time that might've been a 20% raise uh, awesome. just, just for asking and, and, and backing it up. Yeah. And the same thing too is stay knowledgeable. So go beyond even uh, those job comparison sites. One of the best things you can do, a vast majority of industries have, uh, you know, recruiters that work with them or recruiters that work in those industries, get to know those recruiters, reach out. And even if you're not interested in new opportunities, you know, say that you are to get some information and market intel. And one of the things you might actually end up getting surprised, there might be, you might realize, you know, figure out that, whoa, this skill set that you have is actually increasing in demand. And then, you know, there's some company that they know that would hire you. And the thing is, it's all about getting leverage, um, you know, with, with your company. Uh, you know, the statistics show uh, that over the, like, even just 1% salary increases compound significantly uh, over time. And so one of the things, you know, you can, the hard thing to do is like determine whether you should stay at your own company or make the jump. A lot of the data shows that if you make a jump every two to three years, because oftentimes your market value is being reassessed, yeah. you're going to be able to make more and more money. But um, sometimes staying put is, is going to be the best decision. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, though, really undervalue their time. And they also undervalue just how much uh, it would cost to replace you. So it costs about 40 to 60% of your one year salary for your company to replace you in lost time in man hours. And so you can sometimes get a, you know, five to $10,000 raise just because it'd be a lot cheaper than your company hiring someone else. And I see people all the time that like have been in a company for like five years and have some company knowledge and a great skill set, And they're just so worried about getting fired. But in reality, uh, you know, their company really needs them. And you can use that leverage. I mean, there's a talent shortage in a lot of different industries. And if you've been there a while, um, you know, you could definitely, you know, a lot of people think there's a limit, you know, that, oh, I can only get five or 10%. But if you're valuable to your company, you know, you can go in and just uh, ask for a lot more. You can also ask for better benefits too. That's what I recommend, you know, is, is asking for that work remote opportunity. Maybe you know, even if you don't take it, you know, that's just an incredible way to, to maximize the amount of money you're getting paid for your time that a lot of people really, they don't ask for, or I think a lot of people are just afraid, you know, they're afraid they're just going to get fired, but you have to know, you know, it costs a lot of money to get you hired. It would cost a lot of money to replace you. And if you're doing a good job, the last thing your company wants is you to leave. The problem is that most companies, they're really, they're, um, they're legal pyramid schemes and the people at the top are getting the most money. And so your boss's job is to, 
keep you happy enough and pay you as little as possible. And so you really got to fight that a little bit, but you know, you're much, much more valuable to your company than you likely realize. Yeah. And you're, you're right too about sort of there's other ways to keep you happy, like, like, the, like stay at home, but uh, companies are also getting into sort of the, the unlimited vacation time. And, and again, that goes back to just doing your job. It's, it's, it's not about the hours you work. It's what, what results do you get? But I think a lot of the data is showing now that uh, unlimited vacation time actually results in people taking less vacation time. You know, that doesn't ultimate, surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. The ultimate, that, the ultimate paradox. You, know? yeah. you don't have this set number that you feel like you have to take. So that, that doesn't really right. surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to one other thing you mentioned reading uh, personal finance books. Um, and I know you've read, I think hundreds, right? Uh, c- c- hundreds, you, uh, yeah. Do you know what your, your current count is at? I think I'm at like, I'm over 400. I think I'm uh-huh. probably because I just read one last week. For, to, to interview someone for my podcast. So I think I'm in like, I think I'm probably like 407, uh, <laughs> either 406 or 407. But yeah, I've read over 400 personal but finance books. Personal finance books were big for me too. Um, I haven't read that many, but uh, <laughs> the, just just the idea that, that that was kind of my my, my turning point of, of sort of realizing there's, there's better ways to deal with your money. Um, you mentioned what your favorite book was. Is there a couple others that you wanted to sort of give a little shout out to? Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the things is, you know, I'm all, a lot of personal finance books are the same. You know, it's like 99% of the same thing. And so I'm always going through and looking for that piece of gold. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes in a case, you know, the book is actually pretty crappy, but there's some, you know, really, really key insights that, that, uh, that you could take away. A, a few of the other books that I really love, uh, Millionaire Real Estate Investor, uh, is just an incredible book. Uh, it's written by the head of uh, Keller Williams Realty, the guy that started the real estate company. And one of the things you read a lot of real estate books, and they're just like, um, you know, pretty dry or just way too <laughs> bullish. But you know, it's an incredible personal finance primer uh, in addition to uh, a real estate book. Um, one that's kind of on the margins, uh, but I think it's really incredible is more of an entrepreneurship book. It's called Blue Ocean Strategy. I don't know. Have you ever read Blue Ocean Strategy? No, I haven't read that. Oh, man. This, this book will just completely blow your mind. Um, it's, it's, one, it's a business book, but I, you know, I, it, I think there's you know, incredible implications for any entrepreneur or you know, anyone uh, in, in the personal finance space. Another one, the best investing book uh, is probably Boglehead's Guide to Investing. I really love that. I really love the coffee house investor. I mean, a lot of those investing strategies are going to be uh, pretty, pretty U S specific. Um, and yeah, I just read a really good one. Uh, Chad Carson's retire early with real estate. So when I read in the past week, that was, that was pretty incredible as well. Yeah. You, you mentioned the Bogleheads one. Uh, um, the, the little book of common sense investing was, it was a big one for me just to, just to get used to this idea of, uh, of index investing, uh, ETFs and everything. Um, it, it, it totally changed the way I, I <laughs> invested. Uh, I, I thought I was doing so great with my, my mutual funds and I'm probably, I think it was two and a half percent that I was paying. And just this idea that oh. just track the market. Like you, you don't have to, you don't have to try to beat average cause you're already doing better than half the people really more than half when you work the fees in. So it, that, that was yeah, a, a way, way more than half. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Okay. So, so, so you, 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 you had your career, um, but then you, you turned that into a consulting business, right? Yeah. So I turned it into, I turned my job in digital marketing. I left after a year at the agency that I was working at and I actually started two different agencies. Okay. Uh, and there's a particular reason why I did that. One, I wanted an ability to um, have my own company that I could use as uh, really kind of a, a learn uh, a learning opportunity and a testing opportunity. And so I had one digital agency where I specialized in working with law firms um, and realtors, and that was kind of the niche. And then I had a real passion for education. And so I ended up launching an agency and partnered up with two other guys uh, to, to scale that agency, particularly focused on the higher education vertical. And so I wanted to be able to grow a, a vertically focused agency, really niche down, but also have this other one that I could take on other clients, um, you know, as I grew. So I, I played both of those 
um, you know, options, uh, you know, through a six year period. Um, and now I'm no longer involved in any of them. So I, I left my partners and completely got rid of all of my clients last October. So I've completely walked away from, from both businesses. Okay. Um, and, and that leads to you starting your, your blog as well, uh, millennial money. Um, now I know you with, with your story of of going from what was it two twenty six I think to to a million dollars yeah yeah uh, in in five years yeah five right? years three months six days oh yes that's right um, <laughs> so so can, can you tell us a bit how how that's been for you sort of th- this this build up sort of a bit of a movement between the the, the press you were getting and and the 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 posts you were writing and how people were following you. Yeah, so I started the blog in 2015. Um, at the time, I was just spending a lot of my time traveling to different clients. I had over 50 clients at one point. And so I was on the road, I was going to conferences, I was speaking. And I really started the blog as a way to, you know, I just reached financial independence. And I was like, whoa, you know, I want to start writing about this and reflecting on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'd always been really hesitant about putting my voice out there online. First off, I was like, uh, a, um, it was, it was kind of intense. It was kind of scary. And B, I was like, you know, I'm such an intense person that I know that when I start a project, I'm going to get really all in. And I was just like, so burnt out that I was like, Oh, I can't do this, uh, do this myself. But I actually went to the first FinCon, uh, in 2015. I didn't talk to a single person and I was there kind of like sizing up the space and seeing what was going on. And once I went there, I was like, all right, I can make this happen. And so I started writing when I was traveling. So I'd be sitting in an airport, you know, I'd be in some hotel in like Pittsburgh. uh, And instead of watching TV or something, I'd just write blog posts. And so that's really how it started. Uh, And for the first year and a half, you know, I I started building a little bit of a steady following. Um, It was helpful that I picked a really good brand name uh, because I started ranking for uh, you know, people started discovering me who were just looking for how millennials think about money. Um, so that became like an instant sort of discoverability engine. Uh, and then the real sort of inflection point was, uh, you know, late sort of 2016, I'd started writing much more vulnerable content, much more open content, just being very open about the challenges I had had. And uh, yeah, I got a CNBC feature and, there was like a six month period where I was, you know, in over 200 international publications and I've been, you know, on CNBC over 50 times, and, you know, it just became interestingly a really a rocket ship for the blog. Um, Cause I'd kind of been building all the content and not only did I get a lot of backlinks and it helped it rank, but you know, I got a ton of subscribers and uh, you know, really was able to build what's become an incredibly engaged uh, and passionate audience. So you, so you built up all these readers and, and, and now uh, I know in early 2019, you're going to be launching a, a book. Um, how did that sort of evolve from, from the blog? Yeah. So the biggest question that I would get is people would read a post or read a two post, read a couple posts. One of the wild things about my site is the, the average time on page is like really high because I write such long posts, you know, it's like yeah. around six or seven minutes. So people hang out, they read the post. So I, I get a lot of like binge readers, you know what I mean? Maybe they'll be surprised by something I said, and then they'll just sit and hang out on the site for 30 minutes and read a couple posts. Uh, and the number one question I get and got and still get is like, well, how, how did you do all this? You know, like, okay, I see how you did, you know, I see how you started side hustle. I see how you started investing. You know, how, how did, how did you do all this? So they'll ask some specific question related to a post that I wrote. And I was like, you know, really there's just no format beyond a book that I can answer that question. And so, you know, I talked to over 30 agents and, you know, that was just its own process uh, and ended up selling the book to Penguin Random House, largest uh, English language publisher in the world. Um, you know, they loved the vision, loved the idea. It's changed a lot since that time. Uh, and yeah, I was able to, that's the, that's the challenge for me now. I feel like I've literally written everything that I can about money uh, in, in, into the book. And so now I look at the book and I'm really excited uh, and I'm excited to have a place to point people when they're like, how did you do this? I'm also excited to reach people who um, takes a lot of time to read, you know, 
hundreds of blog posts and listen to hundreds of hours of podcasts. So, you know, you can sit down in like four hours uh, and kind of four or five hours and churn through this book. And, you know, I think get most of what I'd want you to take away. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for being on the show. Can you tell everyone where they can find you between the, the, the blog and, and social media and, the, and where they can find the book? Yeah. So millennialmoney.com. Uh, you can typically just Google millennial money and I'm the first result there. Uh, if you want to learn more about the book, go to financialfreedombook.com, financialfreedombook.com. You can learn all about it. It's going to be dropping soon. You can pre-order it. There's a bunch of pre-order bonuses. Follow me at millennial money, at millennial money com on Instagram. And yeah, that's the best place to find me. And um, yeah, really appreciate being on the podcast, Tom. This is a real pleasure. Great. Thanks for being on. Thanks to Grant for sharing his story. There are some great tips there that you can take away to benefit your own career and finances. And I'm looking forward to his new book, Financial Freedom. You can find show notes for this episode at maplemoney.com slash Grant Spatier. That's G-R-A-N-T-S-A-B-A-T-I-E-R. If you know someone looking to improve their career or turn their financial life around, please share this episode with them. And thanks as always for tuning in. See you next week.